Welcome to the Mike and Doug Show. I'm Doug. Hi, Mike. Hi, Doug. Wow. Your last article left a blazing trail through the sky like a lightning bolt. <laughs> 11.4 million downloads of the PDF. In other words, it seems the work that we have been doing has paid off to the point that this seems to be the icing on the cake. What was so amazing about that article? Previously, you've got millions of hits on articles that you have written with the writers at Americans for Innovation and, of course, channeled through Aim for Truth. But what was special about this? What was it that got people so excited that they made PDF copies of it? Not just hits. We're talking about people who had to have a copy of this. This is magnificent. This needs to be made into a book. But today we're going to try to analyze exactly what it was. What was the approach? What was the view? What was the perspective that caused so many people to get so excited about this? Every time that you go out on the internet now, you're finding people talking about the Babylonian Radonites. Well, in your recent article, you pointed out the Radonites are literally the people who controlled all of England, these Radonites or Rudnites. And then it seems that it also connected to basically mercantile banking, the mercers of the city of London, the entire banking system created by the Templars. The Templars were holy knights, they were monks, and they usually traveled in two, just like these rad knights traveled in two. And it won't be too much of a shock to those who have been listening to find out that, yes, of course, the research continued and got deeper, but now perhaps it's like a telescope that just came into perfect focus and people just looked at it and said, this is it, we have to copy this and we have to send it to everybody. So what can you tell us about the new research in this specific article, which will of course be listed below, that was the new aspects or just how it was presented in a way that it was so palatable to people that they just went crazy for it? I think the reason it got so much interest is it finally explained what the city of London is and how it relates to world history. And up until then, we had never actually focused on that. We could see that the city through the bankers has enormous influence and has had enormous influence. But what we had not done was take it back to its origins. For example, the Knights Templar, the city of London predates them. The reference to Rodenites from Babylon was a reference to a very seminal history of the Silk Road trade routes that was written by an Arab geographer by the name of Cordoba in the 8th century. In that, he identified this area of Babylon called Rodan, which I think very closely resembles the city of London. And in fact, the city of London probably copied the patterns of merchant banking from Rodden in Babylon in the way it organized itself right as England was forming itself as a separate country. They had all these kingdoms and all these kings vying for position, and those were all related to various invasions by the Swedes, by the Danes. They were getting consolidated around King Alfred about 50 to 60 years before William the Conqueror, they were already referencing in their histories these rad knights. Rad knights, R-A-D-K-N-I-G-H-T-S. These were essentially merchant bankers who were attaching themselves from the Silk Road to the various kingdoms and barons and the earls of the newly forming English country. Under King Alfred, for example, they had already regularized coinage. As they moved forward and William the Conqueror took England at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, he had ordered immediately an inventory of all lands under his new rule so that he could tax them. And in the process, they defined the Domesday Book, which was an entire inventory of all of the economy of the British Isles, most of the British Isles. In doing that, they identify many times that these rad knights were either the uh, landowners themselves, or they were attached to the barons and handled all their business, including tax collection, enforcement of property rights, and the like. 
And doesn't that sound very familiar with the merchant bankers today? Now, why are we talking about the city of London? Because in 1066, on December 25th of 1066, William the Conqueror was crowned king at Westminster Abbey. One of the first things he did was he chartered the city of London, and it was a one square mile area. He gave them a special charter, which was issued in 1067. So just within months of his coronation, he did that. And in doing so, he made the city of London a separate legal entity that wasn't London. It was specifically chartered to handle the merchant banking of the kingdom. They kept meticulous records of everyone that was a Lord Mayor of London, going all the way back to 1067, and or a Sheriff of London. So they had these two complete sets of records that go back over a thousand years. Now, how many records of any kind of historical body can you see that level of meticulous detail? And one of the reasons they're doing that is because the decisions of the City of London drive the legal environment today. And in fact, the Book of Domes, which occurred subsequently, is still used in settling property rights all over the British Isles. So here we have this entity that was Babylonian Radonite in origin, very clearly. They didn't even change the name, hardly changed anything about them. These guys traveled with William the Conqueror to England to supplement the Radonites who were already in England and they just carried on their business, their merchant banking to this day. And by the way, they're not English, they're not Christian, they weren't Jewish. They were Babylonian Radonites who just happened to assume a moniker of Judaism because it was good for business later on. The city of London is Babylon. I mean, they point blank knew that this was what was going on, and they point blank knew they gave their country away to a person who was not an Anglo-Saxon, not a Brit, not a Celt. And then they made a deal with the merchant bankers. And to this very day, these are the people who control the U.S. Federal Reserve, our largest banks here in America, and basically the largest banks throughout the world. So right. this is a 4,000-year-old institution that has been literally obfuscating so well that if you said to even someone in England, well, you know how your old tax collectors, the Rad Knights, did it with two knights who would go around, one with a sword and the other one with a book, and you either paid your taxes or you were incarcerated or punished by the sword. And I'd say, that's crazy. That didn't mm -hmm. happen. No, it did happen. It did and happen. I think that might be the shock that really got to people. I lived in England and I had never heard of anything like that. What we see here is a criminal, I, I say it's criminal obfuscation of history to make sure that there was no awareness of this millennia long strategy of the merchant bankers to make sure that they seize control of the whole world. And that led us to this additional revelation that because these people were pagan Babylonians, who were they worshiping? because they're just pretending to be Jewish. And in fact, we have some today that are pretending to be Christian, practicing that age-old philosophy of Sabbates V and Jacob Frank, who was closely associated with the Rothschilds. The admonition was, just pretend to be whatever religion in the country is that you are living, but practice our paganism. And that paganism comes out of demonic worship of Moloch, Moloch, Asmodeus, Aramon, Mammon, um, Mammon, uh, and just a host of others. And that was also in the article, a real explicit list of the demons that have been worshipped by these merchant bankers, by right. these merchants. And still are today. There is no Khazarian mafia. There are Ashkenazi Jews who have been around calling themselves Ashkenazi Jews. And they're probably so little Hebrew that it would be insulting to Carter and Ball. Ashkenaz was never a tribe of Israel. And all of a sudden, we've got this made-up name that appeared at about the same time as William the Conqueror and the seizing of England in 1066. And you mentioned Khazarian. Well, by that time, these guys had used Khazaria as a trade route for the Silk Road that the Arabs had blocked that was moving into Babylon. 
and started a new trade route over Kazaria, and they taught the Kazarians to convert to Judaism so that they could say they were something other than pagans. That's why the Kazarian identity arose, and it's legit. They, they were there. They were part of this. But the idea that they were a mafia and that the entire country had converted to Judaism, there's no history that really proves that. Once you see this thread, other things that people have always talked about related to the cultic practices of, for example, Freemasonry, start to make sense. Because we see that these Red Knight bankers long ago took control of Solomon's gold and used that to lever all the financials in the world and uh, applied it to merchant banking. Well, they're not going to ever give up that power, and they have it. And it's a demonic power that is slowly pulling our cultures down. We're not dealing with human beings who could not possibly organize this over 4,000 years. This has to be a demon. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. And when you look at demons, the number one and number two books are the lesser and greater keys of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And when you look at them, they are demon worship. They even give the specific sigils, the symbols for these devils. Solomon, with all of his wives, set up temples for each of those wives that they believed did. in one of these demons. And so when you say demons, you might as well say Solomon. Solomon did not end well. And what he taught us is if you fall to the demon of mammon, you will fall into a pit of hell. <laughs>